So I wonder if you would follow along in your Bibles as I um, uh, read this portion, and then we'll take a look at it. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happen unto you. But rejoice, inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God, and if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Now, just by way of a little outline, if you would like to have an outline regarding <coughs> this section, uh, I believe the major thought as far as the suffering is concerned is the believer's attitude toward suffering and the emphasis of the type of suffering that is revealed here seems to be not a suffering which comes by overt action, that is, from the standpoint of persecution physically or bodily or anything like that, but the type of persecution which seems to be uh, that in the context <clears throat> is that which relates to the opposition by way of that which a little tongue can do, the spoken opposition, the matter of being reproached and so forth like that, or being uh, uh, one that is uh, blamed and uh, dis uh, giving disgrace and so forth. So it seems as though the type of persecution that is before us is that which comes from uh, the slanderous tongue or the mouth that uh, is so capable of bringing hurt and harm to individuals. When I was a student in seminary a number of years ago, we had a chapel speaker. <coughs> and I'll never forget what this chapel speaker had to say. He was a Christian psychiatrist. And um, he made this mention. And uh, it was the first time I'd ever thought of it. But he stated this. An ill-spoken word can be more deadly than a bullet. And an ill-spoken word can be more deadly than a bullet because it can destroy you emotionally, it can destroy you mentally, it can destroy you in, in so many, many ways. The pressure that seems to come by way of slander, by way of uh, ill-speaking, is that which is uh, most depressing and extremely difficult for uh, dear ones. And so it would appear that the context which is before us deals with that type of suffering more or less. So we suggested that in verses 12 to 13 we have a command that is given to us in light of such suffering. And then in verses 14 through 16 the various conditions for suffering and then in verse 17, the fact that this type of suffering is certain for the household of faith. And then in verses 18 through 19, the consequences of such type of suffering. So now let's go back and observe it in light of this little progression of thought as far as this kind of suffering is concerned. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice, inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Now we believe that the emphasis uh, of this passage relates to our particular response, or the believer's response, to this nature of suffering here. And there are a number of imperatives or a number of commands 
given throughout this section. And immediately we're introduced to one of these commands in verse 12. And you will observe to whom the instructions are addressed. Beloved, those who are the loved ones in the household and the family of the Lord. Beloved, <coughs> actually, it states this. Stop thinking it's strange. Stop thinking it's strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. Or uh, stop being surprised or think something is uh, unusual. Now, um, <laughs> we don't like trial, do we? We don't like difficulty, especially that which is uh, leveled at us from uh, the tongue of various ones. And uh, I recall uh, a number of years ago in the southern part of the province when uh, we were pastoring uh, one of the churches there that uh, we had a Sunday school superintendent, one who was in charge of taking care of all of the Sunday school. Now, <laughs> when you are in charge of a Sunday school, you know you have a number of Sunday school teachers. And... Um, uh, sometimes Sunday school teachers are just not too happy with various things which uh, they have to do and some of the uh, preparation and then if someone uh, is a little bit incorrigible and I'll guarantee you if you're teaching children that you're soon going to discover that children are very very depraved and if you want a good example of that just go to the nursery and uh, they're just as sweet as we can be but look out if you give them a, someone a toy that they can use as a club why they'll use someone else to club them. And uh, uh, so uh, this uh, Sunday school superintendent, he came up one Monday after, church, after the Lord's Day ministry, and he said, Dr. Clark, I quit! I quit! I resign right now! Well, I could tell that he, he wasn't too happy. <laughs> and uh, uh, I said, well, now, Keith, uh, before you do this, uh, tell me what your problem is. And what had happened, some mother had uh, laced him. She, she had criticized to no end what was going on in one of those Sunday school classes. And he happened to be a kind of a fellow that, now, if someone criticized him, he just couldn't take it. And so, oh, I talked to him, and I petted him, and, <laughs> and I told him what a great job he was doing. And uh, so he stayed until he until he got the next uh, blast, and then he quit all over again. And so we'd have to help him again. Uh, he would just happen to be one of those fellows that uh, absolutely could not uh, uh, take uh, any type of criticism uh, or rebuff. And so uh, it's a little bit difficult to have uh, a person of that nature and character in a place of leadership, which he was in. Well, the Bible says something in light of believers, brethren, beloved ones, stop thinking it's something unusual or something strange or stop being surprised at what? Fiery trial. Fiery trial, which is to try you. Now, uh, it's amazing, but we have a secret here. First of all, an attitude. And uh, an attitude of something which is certain. The attitude is, stop thinking it's just absolutely amazing that trial's going to come your way. And notice what kind of trial. It is fiery trial. Now, this type of trial is a trial that is leveled at the believer, and if you look it up, it uh, is a trial that is fiery, which is sort of a purging type thing. It is trial to purge out dross. It is trial to uh, test one, and to um, uh, take care of that which uh, should be on the way out. Uh, James chapter 1 is a good cross-reference to this. 
Uh, count it all joy, brethren, when you fall into many testings or trials, knowing that the trial of your faith worketh patience or spiritual endurance. And let spiritual endurance have its perfect work that you might be complete and entire, lacking nothing. And so one of the special designs that God has concerning trial, and called fiery trial, is to be used in the hands of his wonderful grace to purge us, to take care of a number of things which simply cannot be taken care of outside of trial. And so the first attitude is, Oh, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised concerning fiery trial, which is to come your way, as though some strange thing happened to you. This word strange in the last part of the verse and the word strange in the first part of the verse are one and the same. The only thing is one is a verb, the other happens to be a noun or an adjective. And... Um, the uh, strangeness of it is, well, as though some surprising thing came your way. The Bible is teaching us very clearly that trial is one of the normal aspects of the grace of God. And isn't that once again what Philippians 1, 28 or 29 tells us? For it's given unto you in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe his name, but also to what? Suffering and believing are inseparable companions of God's grace upon the believer. Now, that's absolutely the case. And um, it's hard for us many times to get that through our heads. But that's exactly the case. In light of verse 12, the command is, stop being surprised. Stop being surprised, as though this should... Uh, come upon you. But now then, there's another aspect of our attitude found in verse 13. But what? <laughs> Do we? And this happens to be a present imperative. But constantly be rejoicing. Now that's just the opposite of what most of us do, isn't it right? But rejoice. Rejoice. Why? Inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering. Have you ever pondered that statement? Have you ever wondered just what the scriptures mean when he tells us here in 1 Peter chapter 4 that we are not to be surprised concerning fiery trial which is to come upon us, but we are to be rejoicing because we're partakers of Christ's suffering? I've always considered uh, in my thinking that the sufferings of Christ related primarily to Calvary. Now, 1 Peter certainly causes that thought to evaporate out the window, doesn't it? Because have we not noticed over in, for, in, the, first, in second, uh, the second chapter where we're told in verse 21... For even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow in his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he, su uh, when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously." Now then, in verse 24, it tells us he bore our sins in his own body. But the suffering prior to that is the suffering which is very similar to that which comes before us in the fourth chapter. And that is suffering which comes our way because of slander, because of um, uh, ill speech, and etc., it isn't the physical thing. The physical thing for the Lord begins in verse 24. 
All of the other relates to the matter how he was reviled, he reviled not again. When he was threatened, he threatened not again, and etc. So that's the type of suffering that you have in First Peter chapter 4. That's suffering which is going to come our way because of this little tongue. And it's, uh, <laughs> it's uh, believe me you, it, uh, it can really get the job done. Isn't that right? How many of you are just thrilled to death when someone, someone meets you and just, boy, just blasts the socks off? Hmm? Let me see. Well, thank you for that compliment. Do you know that? Oh, not on your life. <laughs> it's just like waving a, waving a red flag in front of a bull. Isn't that right? It sure is. We want to double up our fist. Come on, you rascal. I'll take you on. Well, <laughs> that just isn't the way. <laughs> We're to do it as believers are concerned. Because here, here the scriptures have to say that, but rejoice, rejoice, in as much in as much as you are partakers of Christ's suffering. So the sufferings of Christ in this context is dealing with a matter of his suffering as he walked the pilgrim journey being God's Son from heaven to experience the pilgrim journey in his humanity and all that it cost him to be absolutely faithful to the will of his Father. And so I'm told here uh, in such an amazing, wonderful, glorious passage of Scripture that as Christ suffered in the pilgrim journey in the manner that he did, that when I suffer and when you suffer in this business of having trial come upon us through a slanderous manner, we are literally participating in the very sufferings of Christ. Now, this particular Greek word, for those of you who have had Greek, let me give it to you. Koinonete. Uh, now, that means you're fellowshipping, isn't that right? And a fellowship in koinonia, or koinoneo, the, the verb form, is that I'm sharing in common. And this is again exactly the same truth that you're going to find in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where it's called communion, as we fellowship together around the table of the Lord. Here, you are fellowshipping together with Christ when you're suffering in this manner. And you're supposed to be doing what? Al Clark, you're supposed to be rejoicing. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I sure got a long ways to go in the spiritual life. Because uh, it says here, rejoicing. Now then, he gives me a purpose that follows this matter of rejoicing, being thrilled, and if I could keep this in my thick head, then I could probably uh, uh, be rejoicing more. But it says this, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad with what? Is that going to be a sad day for the believer? Ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. All right, here we have it. For the present, in the time of trial and stress, I'm to rejoice. Because in the future, I'm going to rejoice a whole lot more. Isn't that right? When? When his glory shall appear. I, I'd like for you to turn, hold your hand here, turn back with me to Romans chapter 8, because I think this could be a good cross-reference to the matter of when his glory shall be revealed. Now, this word, uh, this word revealed is, uh, comes from the Greek word uh, apocalypsis, which means having been veiled off, but then being unveiled. See, not ever being seen before, but totally seen uh, later on. Now, I realize that at the rapture, every single one of us are going to be glorified, going to enter into 
a state of great glory because we're going to be fashioned just like unto his glorious body. But I kind of believe that uh, the emphasis that he is giving here when his glory shall be revealed, I believe that emphasizes glory revealed on the earth, I think. And you can meditate on that yourself, but in Romans chapter 8, let me begin reading with verse 16. The Spirit himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And of children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that ye suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Now that's talking about uh, our present life of suffering with the Lord. Isn't that right? That's talking of the type of suffering that's being spoken of over in 1 Peter chapter 4. Now then he says something. The Apostle Paul says something in verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed not in us, but this Greek word is ace, unto us. And then he goes on, for the earnest expectation of creation waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. What time is that? That is the time of his second advent to the earth. Not the rapture in verse 18 and 19. The rapture is going to take place for us for, with our being glorified together in verse 16 and uh, verse 17 of Romans 8. But then he goes on to the second advent when his glory shall be revealed unto us, manifested in the great release of the corruptible nature of creation, when this corruption has been lifted from creation, and then the desert's going to blossom as a rose, and uh, uh, streams in the desert shall break forth, the lame shall leap as a heart, uh, the deaf shall speak, the dumb shall hear, the blind shall see, and... Uh, it's just going to be a fantastic time. There's going to be a great change as far as the nature of uh, the wild beasts. Uh, a, a little child shall lead them, and etc. All these things are going to be such, such glorious events. But there, when the Lord does return at the second advent, for the first time since the days of Noah, for a little while, until the first child is born, there will be nothing but the entire household of faith. The Old Testament saint's going to be there. The New Testament saint's going to be there. And the saint of the tribulation time, as he, if he's escaped, uh, and many of them will, escape martyrdom, they're going to be there. And it's just simply going to be a glorious event. And then God's great glory is going to be manifested in creation like he intended it to be in the Garden of Eden before man fell. And so I believe what we have here is not only the fact that we're going to just be wonderfully thrilled at the rapture, but we're going to be exceedingly thrilled 